Um, and thank you everyone for joining us. Uh, again, my name is Meredith McDill. I am one of two international admission officers here at Smith. And I do a lot of talking about liberal arts education and about women's colleges all over the world, often in a lot of cultures where there's not a lot of familiarity with either. So um, in introducing Smith as a women's college, you know, I echo a lot of what Janet has just said, that back when the college was founded in 1871, um, you have to understand that colleges and universities here in the U.S. were not admitting women. They were only admitting men. So our founder never set out to create anything like a convent or in those days they were, there were institutions known as finishing school, schools for young women. Um, no, what our founder uh, wanted to be able to provide was the same level higher education opportunity for women that the Ivy League institutions like Harvard and Yale and the rest were offering um, just for men. So as Janet said today, uh, Smith College located in uh, Northampton, Massachusetts, uh, about four hours from New York City, uh, under two hours from Boston, has become the largest of the women's colleges with uh, 2,750 students. Uh, they come from literally all over the world. We currently have about 72 different countries represented on campus and 14% of our student body are citizens of countries outside the U.S. Um, you know, like uh, most liberal arts colleges, we have a very small student to faculty ratio, and we offer about a thousand courses in some 50 areas of study. So out of the say, oh, what is it now? Somewhere in the neighborhood, 5,500 uh, different four-year institutions of higher education here in the U.S., there are only about seven um, who, like Smith, offer what's called an open curriculum. And essentially, this is the most flexible course of study you could have at a college or university. Um, it means that there are no, uh, there's not a core curriculum like many uh, colleges have. Uh, there are not what are often called uh, area or distribution requirements, meaning that in order to graduate, all students must take a certain number of courses in different subject areas like math and science and um, sometimes philosophy, a language other than your first language. Um, colleges like Smith who, that offer the open curriculum have essentially um, removed that structure and outside the, on average, 10 to 14 courses that you have to take to fulfill the requirements of your major, um, you are free to take courses in absolutely any area of interest to you. Um, other schools that you may have heard of that offer the open curriculum include Brown University, Amherst College right here in our own consortium, which I'll talk about in a moment. But Smith is the only college, um, women's college, with the open curriculum. Uh, it makes it very easy to double major, and a large percentage of our students do. We have engineering majors who might have a double major in dance. We have science majors who might have a double major in music or art. So it's very easy to combine both your left and your right brain interests at a place like Smith because of our open curriculum. Um, you're going to take 32, a minimum of 32 different classes over your uh, career at Smith. Um, and again, 10 to 14 of those classes will be required to fulfill the requirements of your major. There may be more to fulfill the requirements of your double major or your major and your minor. But outside of that, you're only taking classes and things that you're truly interested in studying. So it makes for a great dynamic in our classrooms because all of the students are there because they're passionate about that subject and not because they're ticking off various requirements that they have to fulfill like they would if they were at a school that uh, either had a core curriculum or uh, distribution requirements. Um, we are the largest women's college in the country and we're part of the largest and most widely utilized college consortium in the U.S. Um, you have Smith with Amherst, Mount Holyoke, and Hampshire colleges and the University of Massachusetts, 
All of these five institutions are within a 20 kilometer or 12 mile radius, and we're all connected by the largest free bus system in the country. So students at any of these schools can choose to take up to half of all of their classes on one of the other campuses. Um, you can also join clubs and organizations and go to concerts and lectures and sports events at the other campuses. And that free bus system that connects us um, runs every hour and runs until about two o'clock in the morning on the weekends. So it's a very lively uh, curricula, uh, um, consortium. There are 30,000 students overall and it gives students access to about 6,000 different classes. So for our students, um, it gives them great opportunities for co-ed socializing. It gives them uh, a great chance to try out those strong voices we're helping them develop as women in a co-ed setting. Um, and Smith is the largest importer within that consortium for whatever reason, having the most students coming from other uh, institutions to take classes here at Smith. Um, and we're doing a lot of research around this. We're not quite sure why it would be that so many young men from the other institutions choose to come to Smith, uh, the Women's College, to take classes and participate in other activities. Um, but it really is a very lively community um, with 30,000 students um, and a lot of intermixing. So you can't think of Smith, uh, you can't think of a women's college in general as a place where you're cloistered away with all women all the time. Um, people who visit the college for the first time are often surprised at the gender diversity they see on our campus, partly because of the five college consortium and how many students, both uh, young men and young women, come to Smith to uh, take classes and participate in other activities. Uh, we have um, uh, what we believe is the first paid, uh, the first guaranteed internship program offered by a college. It's called our Praxis Internship Program. It gives every one of our students the opportunity to get practical experience in their fields. That's really becoming more of a, uh, an unwritten prerequisite for students to have practical experience in their fields by the time they graduate. So here at Smith, uh, the, the rigor, the academic rigor is um, so strong that you really need to focus on your classes during the academic year. So when is it that you can get this practical experience in your field? It often happens during the summer and often your first uh, internship is unpaid. So to give all of our students access to getting that uh, professional experience uh, we have this Praxis Internship Program and we have a wonderful career development office that connects students with these internship opportunities. Um, if you're doing uh, an unpaid internship inside the U.S., then uh, we, the college will give you a stipend of $4,000 to help support you on that internship. But more and more of our students are doing internships outside of the U.S. So if you make that choice, then the stipend increases to $5,000 um, U.S. to help cover your airfare to get to that uh, internship. And you can see how this works, that often you do an unpaid internship with support of this Praxis stipend, and then the following summer, you have professional, real substantial professional experience, and you're getting a paid internship. So students very often do more than one internship during their time at Smith, but after using the one-time stipend, then they're able to get paid internships in their fields for subsequent years. Um, I like to talk about research because if you really, if you're looking at a variety of different institutions from on one end of the spectrum, large public research universities in the U.S., and on the opposite end of that scale, uh, private residential liberal arts colleges like Smith, a huge advantage to you is the access that you have to faculty to do collaborative one-on-one -on -one research with them. And at Smith, about 80% of our students are doing research with faculty, even uh, getting involved in that during their first year on campus. It's often the case that at a larger university, those research opportunities don't go to undergraduate students, students in their first four years, but to graduate students who are pursuing a master's or a PhD. Um, but at a place like Smith, those research opportunities 
are reserved for students in your first four years. So our students are writing uh, professional journal articles with faculty based on the research they've done together. They're presenting at professional conferences based on the research they've done with faculty. So really think about that. Think about how great it's going to look on your CV if after you know four years earning your bachelor's degree, you can say I'm published based on research I've done with faculty. It really is a huge, a huge advantage to students who choose the liberal arts experience and to students who choose Smith. Smith is the only women's college with our own fully accredited engineering program. Um, and students uh, here will major in engineering and graduate either with a Bachelor of Science in engineering, which is much more popular, or um, students, believe it or not, can actually graduate from Smith with a Bachelor of Arts in engineering. Our faculty like to describe our engineering program as uh, engineering for everyday purposes. So you uh, do not actually specialize in one particular branch because here in the US, if you're going to be an engineer, more than likely you're going to go on and earn a master's, a graduate degree in engineering where you'll specialize in your branch. So uh, it is a generalist degree, a Bachelor of Science, most commonly in engineering, um, but you're certainly going to be able to get depth within your desired branch of engineering. You'll take courses in all of the branches as part of the curriculum. And then five uh, particular courses are in-depth courses um, in a specific branch. If you want to take more than that, then you're uh, more than welcome to go to University of Massachusetts in our own consortium and take additional courses in a particular branch of engineering. Um, but it has uh, become very broadly popular and our students uh, go on uh, at very high admit rates into graduate programs as well as into various fields and, and branches of engineering after graduating. Um, we are very well known for our study abroad programs. We had some of the very first study abroad programs offered by a, a U.S. institution of higher education. Uh, and we're particularly well known for the percentage of our students who study outside of the U.S. away from the Smith campus, not just for an academic term or semester, but for a full year. Um, we have four of our own fully Smith faculty-led year-long uh, study abroad programs. They're in Paris, in Florence, Italy, in uh, Geneva, Switzerland, and in Hamburg, Germany. But outside of those offerings, students have access to um, about a hundred different study abroad offerings. They study about in about 42 different countries every year and about half of our students will study outside of the U.S. for either an academic semester um, or a full academic year or a shorter term. We have some summer and winter programs that run about three weeks that are faculty-led experiences um, overseas. I'm going to skip that last point in the interest of time and move to some images of our campus. This is our very highly regarded Museum of Art. It's really a, a pillar for the arts community in our area, and art is the largest department on our campus. Uh, this is our uh, campus center and one of our 15 dining halls. Our campus center cafe is located in our camp campus or student center. Our exercise and sports facilities, um, I like to pause on this slide because this is one of the newest addition to our campus. Um, this is our uh, brand new state of the art, $73 million, 142,000 square art teaching and uh, square foot teaching and research facility that houses our engineering, uh, computer science, chemistry and biochemistry departments all under one roof. I pause on this slide because today at Smith about 40% of our students are majoring in a STEM field, science, technology, engineering, or math, which is quite high for women studying in the sciences. Um, and I also focus on this slide because there's a very big focus on the environment here at Smith. You may be able to see the solar panels on the building 
Um, the, another way in which the building is sustainable, the lab sciences, as you probably are aware, use a lot of water and all of the gray water in the building is recycled. Um, but the fact that, uh, you know, Smith is a wonderful women's art, uh, women's liberal arts college. We have, as I said, uh, courses in over 50 areas of study. We're very strong in arts and the humanities as well as in STEM. But um, I do a lot of debunking of myths that as a liberal arts college, we must not offer anything outside of the arts. That's absolutely untrue with, a, you know, 40% of our students majoring or double majoring in STEM. Um, and I think that speaks really uh, well to what Smith's mission has always been, which um, essentially is to propel women into leadership roles, especially in fields like STEM that have traditionally been male dominated. And we have a really unique living and dining situation here at Smith. I love to say that we're a residential liberal arts college. We require you to live on campus all four years, but we don't have any dormitories. <laughs> and what I mean by that is that in lieu of traditional uh, concrete dormitories, as you might picture them on a college or university campus, our students live in 35 different houses spread out around campus. The smallest house only has about 10 students and the largest of them have about 100 students, but they're all very different from one another um, architecturally and in terms of size. Um, you can either stay in the same house all four years or you can choose to move around to the different houses. Um, they're all uh, student governed. There's nothing like dorm mothers or anything like that living in your house with you. Um, and they all have big and little sibling programs. Um, students become fiercely loyal to their houses. Every student thinks that their house is the absolute best one. And I'll bet Janet could chime in on that. I think Janet, you said that your house was Lamont House, which is uh, still a very popular house here at Smith. Um, I would venture to guess that if you were to observe uh, two Smith graduates meeting in the street for the first time, their first question to one another wouldn't be, what year did you graduate? It would be, what house did you live in? Um, so there's a friendly competition among the houses. Uh, 14 of these houses have dining halls in them. Uh, the 15th dining hall on campus is in the campus center, which I showed you a few slides back. Um, it's a one size fits all meal program. Uh, we have about 10 men, uh, menu items available during any meal period and students um, enter our dining halls just by swiping their student ID cards. Um, all of our menus are posted online, so it makes it very easy to students have, for students to have what I call a progressive or movable feast and they can meet up with one group of friends in one of the dining halls because they like what's being served as an appetizer or a starter. Um, they can meet up with another group of friends um, because they like what's being served as a main course and go somewhere else for dessert. Um, I was giving this talk one uh, time in Paraguay and I had a Smith alumna in the audience who Janet and I were actually talking about just before the session began and she stopped me when I said it's always a challenge for our students to see who can manage to make it to the most dining halls in one hour and 45 minute meal period. Ingrid stopped me and said Meredith that's not a challenge it's a rite of passage you have to go to every single one in one hour 45 meal period before you graduate uh, and she had done this and had dessert in every dining hall uh, it's possible but I don't really recommend it from a health perspective so very unique living and dining situation here at Smith uh, this is Paradise Pond uh, I think it's aptly named a pond right here on our campus. You can see our boathouse in the distance on the far left. I should mention that our students, we want, we don't schedule any uh, classes over our meal periods. We want our students to pause and have a wholesome lunch, but nevertheless, Smithies, as we call our students, are always very highly programmed, running off to a student organization meeting or to meet with a professor or what have you um, during lunch. So one of our options, one of our 15 uh, dining halls is a grab and go option where you can grab a bagged lunch. Um, in the spring, it's popular for students to check out a canoe or a kayak from our boathouse, which you see there in the lower left and have a floating picnic on Paradise Pond. So you can do that as well if you choose to. 
Uh, I like to call this my dual purpose slide um, because yes, here in the Northeastern US, you will experience snow. We have snow on the ground. Um, and I know that many of you will be used to it, but uh, the other uh, purpose of this slide is to show that there is a young man pictured. So they are here, believe me, and sometimes in some very large numbers. Um, we have about 130 different clubs uh, and organizations here on our campus. Remember that you can also join clubs and organizations at any of the other five schools within the five college consortium. Uh, and every year, uh, even in spite of uh, those facts, students might find that there's not a club or organization within the five colleges that focuses on their particular interests. So there is a process for chartering your own new um, student organization. Um, we have 11 intercollegiate varsity sports at Smith. Um, and I was asked to speak a bit about Division Three athletics um, we are a Division III uh, athletic institution, which means that we don't offer um, uh, athletic uh, scholarships. The vast majority of our uh, financial aid is need-based. Uh, but another uh, aspect of Division III athletics that's very important is that um, you're really a scholar athlete on our campus. Uh, academics come first. Um, and that means that you will have a lot of uh, flexibility. Your coaches will certainly understand that your first focus needs to be on your academics. In Division Three athletics, you typically don't have to travel as far for your sports competitions. Um, so you're out of the classroom less in general. And certainly um, your uh, professors will understand your commitment to your sport as well. But they, it doesn't mean that our sports are not highly competitive. And I want to, by example, um, on the left here is uh, uh, Lauren Bondi who was the captain of our uh, varsity basketball team. She graduated just this year. And uh, Lauren was a highly successful, she's from, she's Canadian. She's from uh, Burnaby in British Columbia from Notre Dame Secondary School. Uh, but she was really a, a star athlete uh, on our campus all four years. Um, she was named one of only uh, 30 athletes, women athletes from the entire country. Um, as an NCAA Woman of the Year nominee. Um, she was also named uh, First Team Academic All-American uh, by the College Sports Information uh, Directors of America. She was uh, only the first player in uh, athletics history here at Smith to be named an Academic All-American. Um, and she graduated as a neuroscience major with a minor in education and sports sciences. Um, during her time here, uh, Smith was the regular uh, season conference uh, champion in uh, basketball. They went to the NCAA tournament and uh, made it to the second round last year. Um, currently, our basketball team is also very successful. They're undefeated. They're number one in our conference, which, which as you see on the right, is the New England Women's and Men's Athletic Conference. So um, sports are very Competitive here at Smith. Um, I gave a talk last year in British Columbia uh, in the um, district of Abbotsford um, to a group of young women really talking about athletics as an avenue to a liberal arts ed education. So if you are a star athlete, it's very possible to come play for one of our teams. Um, and we, you know, do give special consideration to recruited athletes during the admission process. Um, so athletics is a big part of uh, student life here at Smith. Uh, our town, the town of Northampton, Massachusetts, has consistently been voted one of the top uh, small towns in America. Uh, it's a community of about 28,000 residents. Again, we're located just about four hours from New York and under two hours from Boston. Uh, it's a very vibrant city. Uh, it is the hub of the five college consortium. So the 30,000 students within our consortium are not only coming to our campus, but they're congregating in our town. 
Um, everything is a uh, safe walking distance from campus. Um, and it's a, a very vibrant community. Um, it's a very environmentally aware, globally aware kind of place. Um, and we have a wonderful, what we call town gown relationship, uh, the college and the town of Northampton. I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, why you might consider a women's college. Um, we're supported by a growing body of research out there that speaks to the advantages to women of studying at a women's college. Uh, for example, the studies show that as a student at a women's college, you're about three times more likely to major in economics and one and a half times more likely to major in the sciences than you would be as a female student at a co-ed institution. You're also twice as likely to go on to medical school or uh, to earn a PhD. But for me, again, it all comes back to our mission around global women's leadership. There's another statistic that says at a co-ed institution, about 85% of the time, the student government president uh, is a young man, even though say maybe 60% of the student body at that co-ed institution may be female. So why is that? Do the young men tend to seek out these leadership opportunities more or are they um, somehow more sought after for them? That's not the case at Smith. That's not the case at a women's college where the leaders of our student organizations are women. The leaders in our entirely student governed housing system are women. Here at Smith, the majority of our faculty are women. The majority of our senior administrators are. So. Think of Smith, think of a, a women's college as a place for you to uh, both observe strong women leaders in action and take on leadership roles for yourself. Uh, Smith is a place for you to uh, develop your voice, hone your voice, and learn how to go out and use your voice as an agent of change in your community. We, our mascot is the pioneer. We are the Smith College pioneers, and we think that's apt because here are some examples of what some of our graduates have gone on to be the first woman to do. They include the first woman physician in Kenya, the first woman director in the office of the UN High Commission, the other examples that you see there. Um, we also claim Sylvia Plath as a Smith graduate. Um, as well as Gloria Steina, leader in the feminist movement here in the States, who you may have heard of. And I, no matter where I am in the world, I ask this question and you would be amazed some of the off the beaten path places where this resonates. But if any of you are a fan of the show Orange is the New Black, uh, Piper Kerman, the author of the book and on whose life uh, the series is based, is also uh, a Smith graduate and we're very proud of her. She's come to campus and smoke, uh, spoken about the great work that she does around uh, women's prisoner advocacy. So I'm going to stop there in the interest of time. I know we have some questions on maybe some topics I didn't cover. So I'm happy to take those. I wanted to give you, oh, I had a final slide that had my contact information, but for some reason that doesn't seem to be showing. I know that that will be posted along with my talk um, on College Tracker's website. So why don't I pause here and, and take any questions? Okay, well, I, I guess that falls to me, which is terrific, Meredith. Um, one thing that you touched on was most of the financial aid is need-based. How would that work for international students? So um, students, uh, we are also what we call a need-aware institution. We will see the students' financial need in the admission process. And we are an institution that meets 100% of your demonstrated financial need. So essentially, if we admit you, we're going to make it financially possible for you to attend. You apply for financial aid at the same time as you apply for admission. And then uh, if you are admitted, you'll receive your financial aid award up to the full um, cost of attendance um, with your, uh, your offer of admission to the college. So it's very important for students to adhere to the published deadlines uh, for applying for financial aid. Um, because if you don't apply to for financial aid when you apply for admission as an international citizen, you're ne never able to apply for financial aid. But I'm happy um, to work at an institution that has such a generous financial aid budget. Um, 
We, about 60% of our students are on some form of need-based financial aid, and I recruit in a, a lot of developing areas. A large number of the students I recruit um, are on full financial aid uh, packages. Does that answer your question? Yes, so in other words, Canadians and other international students can apply for financial aid. Absolutely, yes, and we meet um, your full demonstrated financial need. Fantastic. Uh, question for you. How do you get from Toronto to Smith College? <laughs> the closest oh. to well, you can fly into Boston. Again, that's under two hours away. Um, some students actually fly to New York, um, one of the New York airports, about four hours away. But the closest airport to us is the Hartford, Connecticut, Springfield, Massachusetts airport, Bradley International. The airport code is BDL. That's um, only about 45 minutes away from campus. Um, and if you go to our website, you can see a number of transportation options for getting from uh, Bradley International Airport or BDL to our campus. Okay, that's great to know. Um, one of the things that you mentioned was it, it seems to you and to the, your statistics that uh, everyone seems to come to Smith more than going to the other schools and comes to Northampton. And I. I have an idea why that is. Uh, I have had young men students of mine who wanted to go to Amherst so that they can take the Smith art courses. Um, <laughs> that's true. And as well, uh, it's because Northampton is just such a lively place. Uh, there's always things going on. Back in my day in the early 60s, it used to be on the weekends that all of us went off to Dartmouth or somewhere supposedly glamorous for the weekend. That's not true anymore at all. I've driven through on two different Saturdays in different years. And my daughter and I just looked around. Oh, there's a group of girls. Nope, that's a group of guys. And <laughs> here's a bistro and there aren't any girls there. They probably went to Dartmouth for the weekend. But no, it is, and I, and I asked my tour guide, how do you like living in Northampton? And her comment was, it is just so much fun. And indeed, uh, noticing that one of the bars that I frequented in long ago days, I said to my daughter, let's, let's leave your husband in charge of the grandkids and let's go to this bar. <laughs> <laughs> no, Grandma Jane, we're going home to Dartmouth. <laughs> So it's really a lot of fun. Uh, there were many things that you mentioned. I, I'm really happy that you mentioned that liberal arts isn't just art, drama, music, but encompasses sciences as well. I, I remember when I first went on campus, the first person I met was Claire Miller, class of 62, who was majoring in astrophysics. And I thought, oh, that's so incredible. Um, lots of scientists, and, and my roommate was a biochemistry major, even though I preferred art and English myself. Uh, a couple of other questions. Do you give advanced standing at all for, I've got students taking the IB, I have some doing APs, and I even have some that are doing the Cambridge system, right. that's the English system. Yeah, well, um, here at Smith, we're not a place where you're going to graduate in three years by virtue of doing uh, those types of curricula. Um, but we do give up to a maximum of 16 credits. That's one academic semester. Uh, two students um, who may have done APs and scored a four or a five on the AP exam. Uh, to students who have done the International Baccalaureate or IB and have scored a five, six or seven on an exam. Um, our faculty like our students who have done A-levels as well. Um, and our faculty describe this as sort of a banking system um, whereby process that has actually once you come to campus, once you have successfully completed an academic semester and then you work with our registrar's office and with the class dean's office um, to take a look at which of your courses might be able to substitute for a course you would otherwise be required to take. Um, if, for example, uh, for any reason you have to take a leave of absence, 
a medical leave. Um, you may be able to use some of these uh, A-level or IB or AP courses um, to substitute for a required course. So um, I know that's a little muddy. We do give uh, credits, but it's only up to one academic semester or, or 16 credits. Right. Terrific. Um, you've mentioned two other things that I really think are amazing. Uh, many of my young women are already looking ahead to a career that may or may not happen. But my position has always been that if you are interested in medical school or engineering school in particular, I won't leave out business with this, that if you want to put yourself in the best possible position to qualify for medical school in four years, there is no better place than a smaller college. You've mentioned the research opportunities, which are terrific. The internships, which you can do abroad. Uh, and and I, I know that it's uh, very effective in getting yourself ready for a, a medical degree. Do you also give assistance in MCAT preparation and in advising? I yes. Mean, I know you do, but uh, yes, we just we just had uh, the uh, faculty member who um, heads up medical uh, health profession advising here at Smith come and meet with our admissions office yesterday. Um, so all of this is fresh on my mind. Um, so, you know, I mentioned um, how strong Smith is in the STEM fields. The fact that we graduated the very first woman physician in Kenya. Um, and I think partly our reputation has led to our success and our, and our high admit rate um, for students who apply to medical school after Smith. But what we have is um, a board faculty um, that work with students um, throughout the process of applying to medical school, preparing for the MCAT. Um, and uh, what I learned yesterday is that for students who uh, graduate with a 3.6 GPA and who have scored about um, 510 on the MCATs, we have a 91% admit rate of students getting into the finest medical schools um, in the U.S. and around the world. And I would also add the Canadian student I featured who was the captain of our basketball team um, was a neuroscience major. She had um, something like a 3.9 GPA and she is now preparing um, to apply to medical schools back home in Canada and she's getting um, faculty help with that whole process. We um, actually will have um, about a thousand dollars available to students to um, help with the cost of the MCAT preparation courses or in the other health professions, the um, DAT or the OAT, for example. Um, so this board of faculty, uh, your faculty advisor, pre-health um, faculty advisor may or may not be your advisor, your regular advisor within your discipline, but they will work with you um, throughout the process to make sure that you've taken the prerequisite courses uh, and that you've got both the clinical and the community service requirements that you really need to be admitted to medical school. So a great deal of support and a, a great admit rate here. Um, and another thing that I like to point out is that when you start from day one, you have professors who know you by name. So that when you need recommendations, which you do for any graduate programs, you have a lot of people who know you and are able to recommend you. Sadly, at the, the larger universities that maybe some of uh, our Canadians have heard of, it's, it's very hard to get a faculty recommendation if, they're, if your smallest class was 50 people. I, another area of interest to my students and to me, because I did have a student who did this, a uh, young woman from Toronto wasn't sure she wanted to do engineering. She started engineering, flourished in engineering, and Canadians will know that when she went on for a master's degree at the University of Waterloo, in Canada, that she must have been particularly well qualified to do that. So it's that's exciting for me too. Um, one thing I would like to ask you that I know my students are concerned about, and that is you require SAT and ACT testing of international students? Yes, yes we do. Um, and 
by citizenship, you know, and, and mainly I work with non-U.S. citizens. And I explained that uh, about 10 or more years ago, Smith became testing optional for U.S. citizens. And even though that might not apply, I mentioned that because we know that uh, the a standardized test score is not the best indicator of how you will succeed at Smith. We're a lot more interested in four years of coursework that you've done throughout high school than we are a single test that you take in a four hour setting. But we simply can't make it to every uh, educational system and every institute, every high school around the world. Um, so we feel like, you know, out of fairness, some sense of fairness, for non-US citizens, we need a standard measure. And for students instructed in English, that is the ACT or the SAT. But um, I think that our policy speaks to what I think is a very healthy attitude we have around that test. We know it's not an IQ test, it's a test of how well you can prepare for a test and not every student around the world has equal opportunity to do that. Um, so, um, you know, again, the most important document in your application will be your high school transcript, even though we will uh, require the SAT or the ACT. Thank you. And um, I want to mention one of my students who was also an Ontario ranked athlete, uh, baseball and softball. And I was more than impressed when she said, I'm going to be applying to Smith College. And I said, but you know, you know, you might be recruited uh, as an athlete. And she said, yes, but my education is the most important thing. Well, I know that she played softball for Smith and she was very good and went on to a graduate program in urban studies. So there, there's lots of opportunities for athletes. Uh, and she was able to balance both, um, as well as being Ontario ranked, so she was very good. And the other thing I wanted to mention is that, uh, although we may be loyal to Lamont House or whichever house we lived in for most of our time while at Smith, we always have friends in other houses and go visit them. Um, and one of the great advantages for me was that I learned so much from upper class persons. I mean, you know, I didn't know if any course was going to be interesting at all. And when a junior would say, oh, you must take Mr. Salvatore's European history class, he really makes it come alive. Uh, I, I really benefited immensely from having different perspectives, different experiences. Uh, as, as well as intellectual insights, as, as well as an attitude of great respect for learning and different points of view, um, which I truly appreciated and truly enjoyed. And I can't think of any more questions other than when are you going to invite me back for a visit? I hope <laughs> May 50th, 55th anniversary, <laughs> but it is really lifelong friendships. Uh, and it is a distinct advantage for women, and you won't feel like you're in an ivory tower, remote from all the fun that you may be used to or looking forward to. But Meredith, it's it's a great pleasure to meet you, and I hope that you Likewise. will give my warmest regards to my very old friend, Karen Kristoff, who I understand is retiring, um, and a, everyone at Smith. And, uh, I certainly will. Thank you, Janet, for adding. Oh, great pleasure. Thank you for being As here. a Smithy, we're very proud of. <laughs> <laughs>